don't have much of a memory? Yes, I would um, say that in my prejudice is that it will, but the proof is lacking. I see. Dr. Sanchez, it, it, how are you using this to treat people in Mexico City? Well, we started on the acute uh, event. We were doing uh, treatment early on on neonates that had hypoxic event or lack of oxygen during birth. And so my perspective was coming from the very acute event, acute stroke, the acute hypoxic event of the neonates. So our work of was more oriented in the acute phase. Now we have extended it to the chronic phase uh, slowly because uh, we were lacking all the mechanisms of action that we now think we are uh, improving with hyperbaric oxygen at different levels. Good. I appreciate that. Yes, ma'am. Well, my name is Ellen Creasy, and I apologize for being hoarse. And this is Bill Creasy, my husband. Ten years ago, Bill Creasy collapsed at age 55 with a major hemorrhagic bleed in the brain. And when we got him care flooded back to Dallas, it was so massive and so deep that they told me they could not save Bill and asked me to donate his organs. And I refused. Bill had surgery, but he lay in coma for six months. After that, deep coma with him telling me he'd never wake up, his life was over. And once he did, then he was in pretty much in a vegetative state for the next three and a half years. He did not walk. He did not talk. He had no focus in either eye. He drooled nonstop out of both sides of his mouth, totally incontinent of bowel and bladder, <laughs> and had absolutely no memory, short-term, long-term, nor retention. For three and a half years, Bill sat in a wheelchair and just stared. But I did my homework, and because nothing else was out there to help Bill, there was th they offered us nothing. And the one thing that kept coming up around the world was hyperbaric oxygen therapy. And every one of these gentlemen on the panel, I made phone calls to them on a regular basis daily for three and a half years. I finally was able to get Bill into a chamber when you're never supposed to have any more recovery. And that condition with me in there with him had not spoke at all, no walking, no talking. On the eighth hourly treatment, two hourly treatments a day, four days later, Bill reached up and started tapping on the inside of that chamber and said, hey guys, I'm tired. Can I get out here? And of course, so they're calling, they're screaming, call the doctor, something's happening to Bill. And within two and a half weeks, just breathing oxygen, under pressure, Bill was walking unassisted, he was initiating conversation, the drilling had stopped, his eyes were in focus, and he was getting urged to go to the bathroom. Now he still had no John Brown clue who he was, nor who I was, but I now had a functioning human being to live with, and, and we've continued ever since. And this is our story, and this is our quest, and the reason for this program. Wow, you may give them a round of applause for sure. You want to you respond to those great remarks? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how you could. She's built you up, you know? For sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can you thank Tom? Um, thank you for helping us. Thank you. Well, I tell you, it's an amazing story, and we've heard some similar stories and other things before, uh, but this is this and, and these folks over here mm -hmm. at, at each end of the spectrum are pretty, pretty fabulous, let's put it that way. Okay, come up here, young lady, young, young man, I'm going to get you right out here, right up here in the front, if you don't mind, and talk to us. I'm Bob Kramer, <coughs> and uh, this is a landmark event. I don't think there has ever been before a program with three of the top authorities with the academic credentials of Dr. Sanchez, Dr. Tool, and Dr. Harch. And it's all because of one person, that's Aline Creasy. And I want to just read the summary and abstract of a paper that was written called Hyperbaric Oxygenation and the Cognitive Functioning of the Aged. It's you and me. Uh, that's you and me, yes. Yeah. 20 subjects, average age 67.9 years, were given hyperbaric oxygen, 100% at two atmospheres pressure, for 15 daily sessions at two hours each. Comparison of before and after intelligence test results revealed substantial improvement, particularly in tests concerned with short-term memory and visual organizations. The subject who benefited most were those before Wexler memory quotients were between 70 and 110. The most important part is there was no indication that improvement reached a pat plateau after those 15 sessions. So we really don't know how much more cognitive functioning could have had. The amazing thing about this, Dennis, is this was written in the Journal of the American Geriatric Society, Volume 22, in 1974. 
Wow. Thank you, Bob. I appreciate that more than you know. Now, we've got some graphics, and, and uh, Dr. Harch, I want you to uh, tell us what those graphics are. I want to look at graphic number one, which is uh, the, uh, the normal brain, I suppose, if you want to call uh, what a brain looks like normal. That's, that's it. Is that right? Correct. Uh, these are brain blood flow scans, and the way the brain works is blood flow brings oxygen and nutrients to cells. They metabolize. So it's like gasoline to the engine, and you get neurological function out of it. So what we're doing is looking at a human being where we've taken away the skull and everything else, and this is a three-dimensional construction of the brain's blood flow. So the big broad area in the front is where the forehead, the eyes are right below it. The two areas down below here are the temporal lobes. And in the back, if you cup your head behind it, are the cerebellar lobes that control coordination. And what happens is this type of scan, the slices of which are on the right-hand side, it's a nuclear scan. Uh, when there's a reduction in blood flow of significance, the computer will put a hole there. So this is just the normal face shot of a 26-year-old woman who volunteered in a study I had uh, to allow her brain to be imaged. All right. Now, this, this and the uh, graphic number two, we have three parts in on autism, are going to be uh, in your book, uh, a Hather Lee Press out of New York. I want to certainly give them credit for this. So tell us what this is. Uh, it looks a little different from the other one. This is a face shot of a child with both autism and CP. Uh, who I treated at five years of age. He was one of the first in the country and was part of a study where we were evaluating chronic brain injuries to see if they could respond and assessing them with this blood flow technique. So if we look at this child, you can see there are holes, significant reductions in blood flow in the front of the brain and also down in both temporal lobes. All and right, that was his baseline scan. Okay, let's go ahead and look then after there have been some treatments. Go on to the next one, if you will. Which that is after two. one treatment, and we can see some improvement to both his temporal lobes as well as the frontal lobes. And now if you give the next image, you'll see it after a course of hyperbaric treatment, which on this unfortunately doesn't look, we lost a, a little bit in some of the reproduction, but he generally has more symmetry to the brain. And uh, this child was clinically improved. He was able to you'll see the figures in the book. He was now able to draw better. He was cognitively more aware. And the decreased socialization and lack of attachment to his mother had uh, improved dramatically. Well, we just did uh, two programs recently on autism. And, and it's just a huge, uh, unfortunately, growing, or at least, at least the uh, diagnosis of it is growing. And uh, I don't even know that this particular uh, technology was even talked about on there as, as having application here. It probably wasn't, but based on this child and a series I had subsequently and then a group in California, this has now been duplicated. There's a small pilot trial published uh, two years ago on this uh, with hyperbaric oxygen and another one underway. Okay, let's look at graphic number three, which uh, has three parts to it as well. This is a And this one will blow you away, I think. Uh, this is five and a half years after self-inflicted gunshot wound to the brain. On the right side, you can see the traverse of the bullet up through the right side that badly damaged uh, her. She essentially was a quadriplegic when I saw her five and a half years later. The next one is after a single hyperbaric treatment. And you see a rather pronounced change in uh, blood flow in the brain. And now is after a course of the protocol we were using, which was 80 hyperbaric treatments, which would be the next image. And of course, you know, there's extensive destruction that you can't do anything about. There's dead brain in there. However, the other areas damaged by the blast injury showed improvement, and it was congruent with her clinical improvement. She developed some movement, decrease in spasticity. Her bowels began to function again from the autonomic dysfunction uh, that she had had, and she had a very noticeable improvement. Interesting. Now, Dr. Tula, when I'm looking at these things, first of all, I'm impressed with it, and I'm not, you know, I'm not obviously no doctor or anything else, but. Um, you know, you can look at it and you say, well, these are anecdotal. You know, the anecdotal issue here with Eileen and Bill, the anecdotal issues over here. Tell me about clinical trials and the kind of things that, that yet you think need to be done in order to move this therapy onto the mainstream. Clinical trials came in after World War II. Prior to that, it was simply observational medicine. At the beginning and the end of World War II, biostatisticians began to be put into medical centers and uh, they would take one group of patients who would, or a pool of patients would be chosen and they would be randomly drawn either to be a control or a treat. And they would be divided and the doctor wouldn't know which group was which, nor would the patient. So that when it was over, the, the two groups would be compared, uh, 